I want to call onto the stage Frank Rodham and all of the massed ranks of his cast and crew who are going to be entertaining you this evening. Could you please all come up so we can see you? I think because of Tommy and the experience of Tommy and his success, people imagined I would make a, like a rock opera, another rock opera. And when I looked at the material, and it was a material I was very familiar with, uh, it's about a boy who was 18 in 1964. I was 18 in 1964. I knew this territory very well. And um, so this is going to be a film about the street. It's not going to be about opera. Hello, Jim. What's the matter with you, then? Well, that gear you've got, it's leather. That's it, it goes with a bike, doesn't it? I was really shocked that the way that he wanted to take it was completely realism and, and sort of really kind of carry on in some way the tradition of filmmaking that he'd already established as a, as a kind of documentary filmmaker. <laughs> As an album, I like to look, describe Quadrophenia as the industrial opera. It was very in the streets, it was working class, and it had, to a great degree, within the album, it had a storyline of sorts. What was amazing was that Bill Curvishley, who was a fantastic guy, Roy Baird, the producer, and The Who, because I was so passionate about the direction I went, they just said, do it. So I had no interference, in, they, were, they were superb. There's the money, make a film, thank you very much. It was just extraordinary. It was at the speed of light, really. The whole thing happened just whoosh. They said, look, we've got a script. And it turned out to be a 230-page document written by a fan. It wasn't a film script at all. It was, you know, it didn't count. And then I got this phone call out of the blue from Frank saying, look, we've got problems with the script. Would you come and have a look at it and see what you can do? We've got the money. We want, to st we want to make this film, so we started. Going, we went into pre-production and started writing the script at the same time. Oh, cool. well, what do you mean? I mean, the thing about the script that I read was that it was very bare and kind of skeletal. Stop fucking about! Oh no! Look here, Sonny. Don't you use that language in here? So one of the things that wasn't in the script was there was no sense of period in it at all. That'd be 30 shillings, please. And that, I thought, was very, very important. I it for a Saturday. So, like, well, the scene where Jimmy goes and gets fitted up with the nice suit, you know, going into the, into the, into the booth to listen to the sounds, those kinds of details, which are kind of little details, but it's all texture, none of that, you know, was really in the script. I like to spend a great deal of time on the cast and I convinced the producers that because these kids are supposed to be 18, don't think of trying to get somebody who's done something before. These are all going to be new. I need a lot of time to find them. When I heard that this was happening, everybody, everybody wanted to be in Quadrophenia. We were all Who fans, you know. You fuck all. <laughs> Absolutely fuck all about Quadrophenia. You know, it wasn't a particular fan of the Who at the time. The buzz about Quadrophenia being made was enormous and I just felt I deserved a part in it. And I was arrogant enough to think that way. I didn't choose the cast until the, you know, a couple of weeks before shooting. I'd seen about a thousand kids, uh, and I had my favorites, I had about a hundred of them. There were three of us that, um, that were screen tested for the part of Jimmy, and myself, Phil Daniels, who's, who subsequently went on to play, and uh, John Lydon, Johnny Rotten. I got a call from Frank Rodham, and he said, would I work with Johnny Rotten, John Lydon, to get him through a screen test at Shepperton for a new film called Quadrophenia. So I read the Le Leslie Ash role and I went over to Johnny's apartment on the King's Road and had to wake him up among 50 other people who were just comatose on his kitchen floor. And we worked together. John was absolutely wonderful. He was a natural. He was stunning. The three of us were uh, sort of bumping into each other at Wembley Studios. <laughs> going in one at a time to do these scenes. And then I get, get a call from Frank Rodham saying it's not happening because the, no one will ensure a film with Johnny Rotten in, which I thought was slightly heartbreaking. And then I heard nothing else. I had a fantastic casting director, Patsy Pollock, a really great dame. And 
she brought in Phil very early on, and he'd just come back from doing Zulu Dawn, and he looked like shit. He had he was he looked terrible. He had a white a green coated tongue. He'd got sick in South Africa, and I looked at him. I didn't even want to be in the same room as him, you know, because he looked jaundiced and ill. And I thought I can't work with this kid. He looks appalling. And but as I was six weeks of more casting, she said to me, "Oh, please see him again." And I saw him again. I thought, "Oh, this guy is just the perfect. He's great." Anyway, Phil got. Uh, Jimmy and I was offered chalky, but it was a great part, so I was delighted. What's that, Bombers? Is it Chalky, the ponce. He's a bad guy. <laughs> Through the casting process, I developed my idea of who exactly the character was and what was he. He was a loser, and this kid was—he didn't look like John Travolta. They were, exp I think, the producers maybe were expecting John Travolta. They got Phil Daniels. I knew where Frank was based, which was at um, Wembley. I remember banging on the window of his office and saying, come on, see me for this. And he called me in and I did a scene with Phil and I had to snog Phil in Frank's office. And I think Frank thought I wouldn't do that. But what Frank didn't know is Phil and I worked together two years earlier on a drama. We were friends. And I think in the end, Frank relented knowing I wouldn't go away. I don't think he wanted me as monkey but I was really tenacious about it. Ah, oh, come on, monkey, don't mess about. We didn't do rehearsals, but we did sort of preparation. We found out about the 60s, the 60s music, the 60s fashions. We met some old mods who were coming out of the woodwork, you know, because this was only 1978, so it was only like 15 years after the thing had started and all that. Frank Rodden was so 100% about the true nature of what the, a mod was that we were just sent off to have lessons all the time. For the main actors, I said, you know, first of all, you're riding scooters, you must be very scooter savvy. You know, you must be able to ride these things with one hand and turn and talk to your mates and all that. So I got them all motorbikes immediately and made them drive to and from work and drive all day. You can't imagine any company in the world doing that with a load of teenagers to rent them just motorbikes and let them just go mad on them. We, we were sent off to the homes of people who'd been mods, and we had parties with them. We did some dancing training, we, I took them to meet old mods, we took some speed, I shouldn't say that, but we did. We became immersed. And Frank himself was given carte blanche to do what, exactly what he wanted to do. There was no real interference, and he was given free range. <laughs> The first two weeks of the shoot was in Brighton for the big riot scenes. And that was a hoot, you know, we were all away from home. We were all very young, staying in hotels, hardly going to bed, being very silly and having a, a fantastic time. When all three of you think of Beauty and Quadrophenia, what are the, what, what's the scene or the scenes that come to mind most strongly for whatever reason? It's the riots. Um, it has and, to be the riots. And when That's you, what we started with, the riots. Yeah. With, with the policeman remember. messing around. I know I hit the policeman for real. And um, the thing was, there were so many people in Brighton the day we were shooting the riots, we didn't know who were civilians and who were actors. I jumped on a real policeman's back, a modern policeman. He said, no, not me, son. <laughs> I said, I'm oh, sorry, officer. And we just went for it because we wanted to be on camera and, and we ran as fast as we could. At one stage, I overtook Sting because I was a better runner. And, you know, I thought, I'm going to be on that camera. I've been standing all day and I'm not going to miss this. And we were just heading for the camera, hitting people as we ran along. Oh, sometimes we didn't fun. know where the camera was. We just knew we were in a crowd of 200 people going ah, up the street and we were going to wreck a cafe at the end of it. So that was all we knew. <laughs> One of my favourite moments is in the middle of the riot, and I get Pete, who's uh, Steph's boyfriend, to uh, throw a plant pot through a fortune teller's window. And I said to her, there's a guy in a red, he's, the only, he's a guy in a red jacket. When you see him, duck. And I, there's this terrible moment when the cameras are turning over, he's throwing the plant pot, and she's looking over there. <laughs> the plant pot is... <laughs> my overriding memory of the fight scenes are that you do it in 10 second, 20 second bursts. And then everybody, mods and rockers, would just laugh their heads off after the take. <laughs> there's a scene where there's some stones being thrown. Now, those stones weren't stones, they were potatoes. But if you get hit in the head by a potato, it still hurts a bit, do you know what I mean? But um, it, was, I mean, it was just a blast, it was a blast. 
In a feature film, you create the action, you create the scene. You decide where to put the camera, where the people are going to be. In a documentary, often, especially Cine Verite, they're doing it anyway. So the cameraman has to up with the camera and move and find the moment and be motivated by the characters. That's the style I used for, for Cordofino. I said, we're going to do the same. When we shoot this, we're going to be motivated by the movement of the actors, not the other way around. Oh. 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 Phil Daniels isn't here, but we should talk about him as character Jimmy and his, uh, Phil Daniels' his performance as well. The thing about Phil, you think he's just a bit of Jack the Lad, but he's incredibly solid. He's, he's so intelligent, he's so solid, he's on top of what he does, but he doesn't give that away. And I think that makes him very, very special. And he had to carry a lot in this film. It was exhausting. Um, we were doing night shoots, we were doing day shoots, and for Phil, it was non-stop. He didn't get a day off, and I, I don't think he ever... He never collapsed, he never gave up, he was always there. I think it's sort of unusual leading character, really, because, you know, he's not supposed to be the best looking. He's not a hero. You know, he's a kind of everyman character. And, and yeah. Phil did that brilliantly. But it wasn't like he was, you know, it wasn't like there was a sort of Brad Pitt character or something <laughs> that was carrying the movie, because it was very much an ensemble, although it was all about him. The thing about Phil is that there's a point where, near the end of the film, where he's hit by a postman, but th there was no dialogue for that in the script. And F Phil improvised that whole scene about Mr. Fucking Postman, and he really went for it full on. And the postman was a stuntman, and he just thought it was for real. He was answering back. The stuntman was so engaged that he started giving a good, good performance. Get off! Get off it! There, oh, there it is, on the floor now. You're lucky you ain't been killed by him. Oh, fuck you, lucky. Yeah, do I? Of course you are. You're a bastard. Oh, she didn't see you. you. I don't even know where you came from. Go away. 15 years I've been trying, never had an accident. Ah, I never had a fucking accident, but you got me, didn't you? What did to kill me? Right. Oh, I love you. Oh, you fucking pissed the postman. Fuck off. Come Go on. on. It's a masterful performance comparable, we said at the time, with De Niro's performance in Mean Streets. And I think, I think actually, I've never really understood why Phil didn't go on to become a huge star after it. Frank, could you tell us a bit about the reception the film had when it first came out? I think in the UK it, was, it, wasn't, a, it wasn't a special opening. I don't think it had that much impact. I mean, there were some good reviews, but I don't think it was special. It was the Americans that adopted it, you know, and I think Newsweek... Uh, wrote a very good article about a, a new kind of film coming out of England. The reviews that's what, that's were mean. Our... They were so mean, the reviews. I don't know why. I think because the build-up to it and possibly because Sting was becoming so massive and things like that. But as you say, generation after generation discovered it and, and just pushed it forward the whole time. Yes, that's what I remember. It didn't make a, big, a very big splash. I was mostly working in the theatre then. I sort of went back to the theatre in the day job. And people ask me now, oh, Quadrophenia must have changed your life. And it really didn't. But it, um, it, you know, it proved it had legs. And here we are, 35 years after it was made, still talking about I it. I think the main thing was when it came out on VHS video is when it yeah. started to become popular. And yeah, and numbers. different, as Toy just said, you know, different generations discovered it and it spoke to them. At the time, American films were all about success. The best fighter, the best guy, and guest guy in the bedroom. Everybody was great looking. You know, and I thought 99% of the people are failing, failing 99% of the time. Um, so we'll, 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 we'll embody that into the story. And I think that's why the film has endured because young people growing up look at that film and they see a kid who's not great in bed. He's not great at a fight. He hasn't got a great job. He doesn't get on with adults. And I think that, is, that teenage angst and that teenage reality makes, makes young people feel secure. The adolescent dilemma and the adolescent problems don't change. If you strip away the tunics and the uniforms, you know, the mod clothes, if you strip those away, you're left with the same problems that kids have got today. This is a, a working class movie. This is about the, it's not really, this is not really a mod movie. This is a film about the, the, the lack of hope if you're at the bottom end of the working class, you know, you, it's very hard to have an interesting life because you are really stuck. And I came from the northeast of England. A lot of people I grew up with are very stuck. They don't get out. And 
And I think that, I think Pete understood that intrinsically. He understood about losers. You know, that he wrote the album. It's, this is Pete Townsend started this whole thing off. I think Roger got it. Shep was Bush boy, you know. I think they got it. Maybe they thought it, would, it looked different from what they thought, but I think they looked different from what they thought it would be. But I think in the end they were happy with it. Whatever you do, whatever film you make or whatever album you make, you always reflect on it later and think, wow, could I have done that better? So it's, real, it's a real endorsement to see it still being shown on TV, to see people rediscovering it. Um, I've been working for some time now on what I could see as a sequel to Quadrophenia, where we pick up Jimmy a number of years later and um, it's looking really good, so um, I think I've got a chance with that, you know, so I'd really like to make the sequel.